Hello, everyone. This is Professor Hamamoto. It is March 26, year 2023, 6 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. I hope you're doing well. I decided that I'd go live on the basis of a couple of books that I was, or authors rather, I should say, that I was reviewing for possible use on the Professor Hamamoto channel here on TubeView. And uh, I want to tell a couple stories on myself before I proceed into the matter at hand, specifically on the, the mysterious death of Jim Keith. Uh, so bear with me. Uh, I'm going to try to pack this into a 60-minute format. Um, if I go over, well, that's okay. Perhaps we can take the conversation or extend, uh, do, a, do a second part of this. But let me just inform you that um, I did get the book by Robert Blair Kaiser. I've mentioned this on a previous talk. And he wrote, I believe, an incredible account of the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy, right? He was assassinated at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles shortly after he won the California presidential primary. It looked like he was headed to the White House. And um, I've got the book, thanks to the Patreon sponsors. It uh, has a great title. Titles are deceptive. Uh, because I had great expectations for the book. It's titled Clerical Error. And I thought I was going to find out um, a little bit about Father Malachi Martin, or Martin, or Malachi, as sometimes it's pronounced. I think he preferred Malachi. Um, most of you know who he is, um, or think you do. So I'm going to skip his um, his uh, biography. So I thought I was going to find, but but so far I've come up with nothing. So I might not. I might just skip over that book. However, this is an important book in light of the fact I just learned this today from a what I consider to be a highly credible source that Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is running for the presidency of the United States of America. Right. This information has just broken. I don't know if it's it needs to be confirmed. I think it does. But um, it sounds like it's going to happen. I've been hearing whispers of this or some talk. Of, oh, by the way, this is signed by Robert Blair Kaiser. I don't I don't have a I bought it used too, July 1990. But it's a very, very good book uh, that talks a lot about the, the use and misuse of psychiatry in the forensic analysis of uh, the supposed perpetrator, Sarhan Bishara Sarhan, who, by the way, was studying Rosicrucian. And the book inspired me, this book by Robert Blair Kaiser, inspired, inspired me to look into the milieu of Pasadena, something I've always wanted to do. And I came up with an incredibly incisive talk on the Pasadena tournament of Rosicrucians that people celebrate ceremonially. They don't know what they're celebrating on New Year's Day. And of course, there's a Rose Bowl uh, football contest, right? A gladiatorial gladiatorial contest of um, uh, Division I NCAA sports. I'm sure um, all the uh, FIBA files are really into it, right? The people... Uh, <laughs> the ones that were in the network at Penn State. Remember uh, Joe Paterno and uh, all those characters? There's a whole network of those people. Everybody's focusing on, which is, is okay, it's focusing on pedophilia. But what about ephebophilia? Right. That's where a lot of the uh, decision makers of the present were cultivated and groomed and, and put into certain positions, whether it's running a certain high-level operation, out of uh, so-called Silicon Valley, right? Or um, they could be authors, right? They're, they're actors, right? Or they might literally be actors, but I'm talking about their, um, a, um, uh, what, um, see, I forgot his name. Somebody came up with this notion of a lifetime actor, right? Who, who with, without really specifying how they are cultivated. This is what I've been doing here. So that Robert Blair Kaiser book, that was a bust. I had to start from scratch. So I thought this would be a really pr uh, productive 
uh, inquiry. If you can't read it, this is called The Occult Roots of Bolshevism. And this came up in the algorithm on uh, the retailer that ate the world. And I said, well, this looks pretty interesting. I wonder what this guy's come up with. So I got it. Thanks to the Patreon people, I read it. And um, it's a short book, but it's very incisive. And it talks about how, contrary to what we, especially baby boomers, right, we baby boomers were given a really, really distorted picture of the Soviet Union at the time. And it's Russia now, as you know, the Soviet Union collapsed. And that was our our big mortal, our mortal enemy, Red China. Now it's uh, the Chacoms. And now it's the Russians again. See how these cold warrior... That's why this is important. This, this material that that and these political um, twists and turns that we thought were over or we've overcome them, they they come back to haunt us. Right? These ideas, these ideologies are never really dead. Um, so we have to keep open to uh, revisiting them. And also, and this is why I'm doing this talk on um, because the the, the memory is uh, very short to begin with, but there's also a deliberate attempt, and I'll get to one of the examples here in a moment. That's why there's a de deliberate attempt to blot out their memory, right? In the Soviet Union, they just used to erase your picture. You became a non-person. You were taken out of the encyclopedia. But here they just create new uh, pundits. I call them pop-up pundits, right? These are these are the, uh, I would give a talk on a couple of them already, but it, there's a new one that I wanted to point out to you. And again, it's an encounter with a book because unlike other people, I feel that it's important to read the books, uh, assess them, and then come up with an opinion as opposed to people saying, oh yeah, blah, 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 blah woof, woof. Anyway, you might check out this book. So this is very promising. Um, and it also, in, uh, the subtitle is From Cosmist Philosophy to Magical Marxism. Uh, Marxism is an occult. I, I knew this when I was in grad school, when all my professors were supposed new Marxists. Not old Marxists, not the Stalinists. They were new Marxists. They called themselves neo-Marxists, right? Because they were into Gramsci, or they were into, it's called cultural Marxism today, but it comes from Antonio Gramsci and the people that um, that followed his footsteps, uh, the, the new left, because the new left, which were Marxists, their, their parents were typically... They're called red diaper babies. Their parents were um, either Trotskyists or Stalinists who emigrated from Ukraine or Russia, or Central Europe. You know, many of them were Jews who were fled the persecution, and they uh, were they took with them their their um, their their Marxism. And the leadership of the New Left reflects that. Its uh, majority leadership was was Jewish of a second generation Marxism, but they didn't want the baggage of of Stalinism or Leninism, and certainly not Maoism, right? All of those heavy, still very much heavy pre Maoist presence, right? Which the Chacom propaganda is conveniently ignoring. Maybe that's part of the PSYOP. And they're they're very heavy in the Bay Area in San Francisco, in particular in Oakland. Yeah. But we got to deal with Putin, right? And uh, there's there's a little bit of mention in, in, about Vladimir Putin and his family and their background with the older tradition, which, by the way, the good news is, uh, is that the older um, Eastern Orthodox Christian tradition never died, even under repressive political systems, Stalinism and Khrushchev. It's starting to loosen up because Khrushchev famously denounced, uh, well, didn't denounce, but um, critiqued Stalin. And then you know about Glasnost and, and all the other. But uh, as it turns out, uh, there was always an, a very robust underground um, Orthodox Christian movement uh, until 91. <laughs> and I, I was in Berlin after the fall of uh, the, the so-called Berlin Wall. And then, as it turns out, uh, Bolshevism didn't, or Stalinism, or... You know, the Soviet system didn't have control over everybody. So what does that mean to us? We, we, us, you know, Americans, no matter how much this techno totalitarianism seems to have control, right? Well, all the different psyops, we just recently came out of one, right? 
I'm not going to go into the specifics of that. If you were around here in the U.S. or living around, it was a global psyop, right? You know what I'm alluding to, right? In spite of that, it's not going to happen. The people, right? It's not going to happen because I've been doing a lot of work on psychiatry and neuropsychiatry and neuroscience. They think they're going to be able to get through us uh, via the human brain, right? And I've been doing a lot of research on that. Um, and uh, the, the people who are the pop up pundits are retarding the forward progression, right? They are dealing with sexy Nazis or the CIA and the OSS and Alan Dulles. Those mofos have been dead for a year, for decades sometimes, right? And this is why I'm telling you, this is why they're allowed to thrive. And this is why they're being inserted in certain cases. And this is why TubeView has put uh, aside, has, has um, given people, quote unquote, strikes. Oh, yeah, we love the baseball metaphor. Three strikes and you're out. Oh, yeah, MLB, Major League baseball i'm i'm starting a league called me mlb major league badminton it's going to be dominated by just all asians because we rule it's a sport yeah but uh by the way all that stuff's going away it's all gonna go uh video games are gonna video professional video game sports are gonna take over so i'm just giving you a uh, investment tip for, for the near future so anyway so i was heartened by this pretty good book. And, and by the way, it also turned me on to reading on my own about cosmism, occult Russia, a good book. I haven't cracked the books yet. Russian cosmism and the Russian cosmists. These are all very expensive academic books. And it's a uh, religio political movement that I was unaware of. Because like I say, I was a baby boomer and anything Soviet, anything Russian was off limits. Right? They, they, so the media was just saturated, was just denigrating uh, racists. I don't know, because I, you know, I guess they're Slavs. So, you know, world history is full of racism against Slavic peoples. That's where the, the root word slave came from. So maybe there's this, this fear, right? They're going to pay us back or pay, pay the West back by enslaving us through their foreign ideal. So anyway, the point is, is that even to this day, I was not really attuned to reading. Um, well, I've you know read the literature and whatnot, but I don't really understand the the, the deeper currents out of which people like Tolstoy arise, right? Or even Dostoevsky. I know Dostoevsky was heavily into mysticism. If you read the books, that there's all kinds of mystical currents in there. But but your literary critics, who are, tend to be non-believers, even atheist and hostile towards Christianity or uh, Eastern Orthodoxy or even Judaism. They won't talk about that, All right? Uh, so I'm reading up on Cosmism. I hope to bring you a talk or two about it because it's quite timely in trying to understand these, this uh, synthetic conflict in uh, Ukraine and Russia, right? Um, th th there's an occult dimension to it that is not even being touched upon that I suspect is in this literature on cosmism. This is one of the main reasons I think that the uh, the nation itself, Russia, is under attack by NATO and the United Nations. There's been a generation, multi-generations long process of uh, destroying Judaism and destroying Christianity and destroying Orthodox Islam. Uh, you know, there's I don't have to go into it. There's there's all kinds of operations, and Buddhism. Buddhism has been infiltrated, and um, you know, take any world religion. Uh, speaking of which, um, uh, I said, okay, let's see what uh, prof. He's not a professor. He's got a PhD, and this is one of the this one of the, one of the warnings for you as a as a critic, person of cultural forensics. This is why you just can't accept anybody who comes on YouTube or comes across on the algorithm. You got to read their material. Just because someone comes up with a two volume, uh, you know, doorstopper series that say, oh yeah, it's the black male society. I'm going to lay down the whole structure of you. That that doesn't make her or him a uh, expert. It just makes them, them a, a, um, a papa pundit, someone who's a good 
um, transcriber of other people's materials it's called plagiarism. You know what it is? So I said, okay, he's not a play. He's, 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 um, he's operating on scholarly by scholarly standards. And I looked at, I think he announced it himself. He got, he had a PhD at, uh, in religious studies, I think at the university of Texas. Now I haven't verified that, but I can tell by his writing, he, he, he's operating, uh, it's not really ugly, uh, horrible academic prose, but he's he's uh, he holds himself to that standard, and that's also true, especially true in this larger book, The Occult uh, in National Socialism. And this book came out in 2021, 20, fairly soon. I think he had a hard time uh, getting it published. Um, and it's not what you think. You think this is another book about sexy Nazis? He makes it very clear, Stephen E. Flowers, PhD, that this is not another Joseph P. Farrell book. He doesn't name him, he, he, but he does mention um, uh, the other super big guy that, that keep appearing on each other's show, uh, who per, keep perpetuating that sort of spin cycle on, on Nazis. Not that it's untrue. It's just like, uh, hey, you know, it's uh, 2023. And we know about Operation Paperclip and uh, Heinrich Himmler and the occult. So he specifically talks about the pre-national socialist occultic tradition in Germania or Alemania, right? And he's really good at it. And he's saying it's not an exclusive property of the Third Reich, nor is it is it unique to Nazism as such. And I think that's a salutary contribution for us, right? So we can get out of the spin cycle of sexy Nazis that I keep talking about. Um, and he criticizes certain, you know, mostly academic uh, writers on Nazism because there's tons of people on YouTube and the pundits talking about Nazis as if, as if they really studied or understand it, right? They're kind of like these fools on in white noise, this professor who has founded an, an innovative program in Hitler studies. It turns out he doesn't even know German. <laughs> I saw that movie. Oh, that's another bust. That was another two and a half hour investment of my time to find, to uh, follow a lead about the incident in East Palestine, Ohio. That's how it's pronounced, Palestine, not Palestine. But Don DeLillo, who I think, I suspect he might have a larger role in creating literature for the elite just as they have literature created for the science fiction buffs and for the romance people uh, and all the different shades in between the 50 shades of propaganda in the uh, publishing companies, which are dominated mostly by women from elite, uh, either Ivy League or liberal arts colleges who won't give me a book contract because they don't want to promote a heterosexual Asian American man they want to promote a gay, black, Latinx, you know, white, of course, definitely, but not me. I'm heteronormative. That's the term that they learned over at Sarah Lawrence College. Yeah, Sarah Lawrence, where this guy, Larry, what's his face, enslaved a bunch of Sarah Lawrence students. You would think they'd be smarter than that. No, 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 because it's they're all in a cult. Uh, formation here, whatever, whatever this institutional setting is. So anyway, I got lured in by the first book, and then there were certain anti-Christian, um, which, you know, you're free to be. You can be critical of Christianity, but I could tell there was a hidden agenda going back to this one here, and he was promoting his own tradition. So I, I got to check this further out. So this wasn't total bust. Uh, so Stephen E. Flowers, I got the next book, and it's about original magic. That's the title. He, so he goes from the occult roots of Bolshevism, the occult roots of National Socialism, and he, he reveals, as which I suspected starting at the very first book, his true colors. He's he's um he's 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 into pre-Christian, pre pre-Judaic -pre religions, going back to Persia, the Persian Magi, and he out he calls it the original magic. And you know, Judaism, Christianity, uh, they. You know, they're syncretic. They adopted a lot of uh, theological components, maybe even ritualistic components like sacrifice, animal and human sacrifice. Uh, Christianity ended that. But 
they adopted it from you know Zoroastrianism, right? And uh, this is making a resurgence in uh, the academic world or people with uh, advanced degrees. And this is all part of the process to undermine the uh, Judaic Christ and, and the Christian. I don't like to conflate them. They're, they're distinct but related traditions. Um, and and they're, the, they're the basis of the American Republic, N not, not this stuff, not this. Even though as we're finding out a lot of the so-called founding fathers and their wives, because women are very important in the background in this. They're actually the ones who are who are behind all this, right? You, we know that they were involved in, in this type of activity. And talk about women who were involved in this, uh, in my research on the University of California that I've been doing for my book. That's why you haven't been seeing me as often as you typically do. Maybe you're happy about that, but I kind of miss you. And I'm doing this on Sunday so I can commune with you once more and share all these um, fascinating, and they're inherently fascinating, but they're important to our survival as a human species, right? You know what they're up to. In general, you know what they're up to, but I'm getting specific and I'm going to the, the origins of it. So you have uh, Phoebe Apperson Hurst, right? I've mentioned her before. I just assumed she was one of these crazy, uh, you know, occultists. They call them spiritualists. Yeah, I called them crazy. I'm sorry. I apologize. I'm not really. Because um, people like William, you know, people, authorities, William James, uh, as we know, Aldous Huxley, who drove, came to America and drove through, through uh, New Mexico and to visit D.H. Lawrence and all the British expats that were living uh, in Hollywood to, to bring it up to the cultural standards that they're more used to, right? Because the, uh, the immigrant Jewish uh, founders of Hollywood were very self-conscious of being um, uh, uneducated, non-educated, and speaking with an accent. So they associated British culture with quality, and they thought that this is what America needed because America is a bunch of rubes, and we didn't have our own culture, our own... You know, I'm being sarcastic because we, we, we had it all along. And I'm just explaining you how the uh, British psyops were able to, uh, to establish a, a foothold in America very early on, even, even um, during the silent era of films. And, and they never left. It's not the chat comms, ladies and gentlemen. You know, I did a whole talk on Hammer Films, right? Where do you think Roman Polanski came out? He came out of Hammer Films, the fearless vampire killers. Even though it's a parody, it's like a a, a foreshadowing of his later career when he when he finally got over to the big time, big money productions, right? Like Rosemary's Baby, right? So anyway, let me finish up real quick, because I have to get to the tribute of of our our topic today, right, Mr. Jim Keith. So then he lays out the good religion, Occidental Temple of the Wise Lord, and he goes, I think this is his pseudonym. Now he's Darban Eden by this time, by the fourth book of his, and to find out that he started his own religion. All right, that's not, I'm not done yet. I'm not, there's one more step that I have to take you. And it's a warning, you gotta read this stuff. You gotta follow it and follow your hunches and you have to read against the grain or you have to read critically. So I come up with the last book that I ordered. Now he's added his wife to the the uh, list of credits. You know, she's probably present here, but he now he puts her on the cover as he should. And um, so you've been following me, right? The occultic tradition, Bolshevist, National Socialist. He's, he claimed that he's a pre-Christian, pre-Judaism uh, person, Zoroastrian perhaps, I don't know, but he started his own church. Fine, that's okay. We're, this is America. It's a religious pluralist society, right? That was part of the design of the Republic to, to reduce the possibility of these, uh, these incredible religious-based wars that racked Europe for Sometimes a hundred years, right? So here's the last book that I got. Now I'll read him some more because he's he's worthwhile uh, on certain levels. But here's here's the kicker. This is why I'm spending so much time. I wouldn't waste your time unless there was a payoff. And here it is. Here's the final book with his wife, 
the most recent. It was originally published in 1990. And if you can't read it, the title is Carnal Alchemy. Let that sink in. Carnal Alchemy, sadomag Sadomagical Techniques for Pleasure, Pain, and Self-Transformation. It's the same author. All right. And he's serious. These are the people we have to take seriously, not the pop up pundits. They're a distraction. And they're for the fanboys who, the first, first little uh, goose that they see after they pop out of the egg, they start following them around like little devoted fanboys and they'll protect them to the death. So here's another fanboy bait that you would like. Her name is, this is the third one that I'm going to go on to uh, Jim Keefe. This just came to me yesterday. And so I said, I got to go live on Sunday before I forget this. Uh, and while I'm still hot under the collar of it, this is the Deep State Encyclopedia. Uh, I saw her mention it on True on Really Graceful. Right? She seems like she's the the um, the reincarnation of this woman who we used to see. She disappeared. I don't know. She was from Canada, but presumptively she was an American, right? Because you know it's Canada. Big mistake. That's more the British Empire. It's they're not Americans. I keep harping on that, but it doesn't really sink into people, right? That's their five eyes. They're part of the the post-imperial um, Anglo-American power block. And just because they're nice people and, and great and, and it's a beautiful country, the, the landscape uh, does not mean that their their interests are aligned with with Americans. And I'm a third generation American. I keep have to telling you that because uh, most people see me and they think, ah, oh, it's the enemy from World War II. Or if you were born, uh, you know, later than you're, Mr. you know, I'm Mr. Miyagi. However, I am finding that I that that my my racial stock, um, not not you know genetically only, but my racial stock, as in stock market, my value is. Is, is rising because there's a whole generation of people who are in their late 30s and 40s who were socialized by Japanese video games and they're totally into it and they're making music. It's called 8-bit music and they're improvising complex jazz compositions on the basis of the tunes, these really low resolution coming off of their Nintendos. Right. And there's some serious study going on about the video game culture. And uh, by the way, the video game industry is larger than all American professional sports, cinema and uh, video, all entertainment combined. That's the video industry and it's the Japanese industry. Right. Those, those are all their heroes, all those composers who were working for Nintendo or or Namco or whoever else, right? I missed it because, you know, I'm of a different generation, but that doesn't mean that that it's it's um it's going to escape my critical attention. I've been studying the sociology, the culture of video games for quite a number of years yet, but that's a far cry from living it. Right? I did not live it, so I can't really come up with with the incisive types of understanding that I think is important. And I'm saying that is because I lived in the belly of the academic beast institution. And very there are very few people like me around who can talk about cultural Marxism because he studied it and he was surrounded by people who are neo-Marxist Gramscians whose, whose parents were red diaper babies and they're like new left people who are in the university and they took over all the major institutions. That's what we're seeing now. And this book here has an entry on cultural Marxism. Like she calls it the encyclopedia. I'll just use one, one example. And uh, the city of London, you know, Comet Ping Pong is a listing here. Shows you how, how uh, incisive she is. Well, anyway, yeah, cultural Marxism has a, yeah, it, it has, here's, here's the total entry of cultural Marxism. It's like, Slightly more than a page. Well, actually, if you take out the heading, it's not even a page. Right. And this was supposed to be the bane of, of American politics in 2023. So this is another pop-up pundit. Her name's really graceful. She's promoted because she almost shows up in my 
feed. She's really nice. She's sweet. She's well-mannered. She's non-aggressive. She's, she's the exact op opposite of, of me. She's a woman too, right? A young, you know, probably in her thirties. I don't know, but uh, she's not sophisticated enough to lie about her or at least fudge the truth. She comes around and says, yeah, when I started watching YouTube back in 2016, so she admits that she's a pop-up pundit. I have two magic giveaways. One is that she only started in 2016. The other one is that she got all the material from TubeU. No wonder me and my friend and colleague, John O'Loughlin, keep getting put in TubeU jail because they're pushing us aside for really graceful. Do you understand why I'm spending all this time in order to help people who are in this channel just by accident? Right? I know the people who are on my Patreon and, and the regular subscribers who should be on my Patreon, but your, your regular viewers, you, you know all this. But I just by the nature of, let's say, talking about a Paris Hilton, the, I will have tourists come in, and, and um, which is great, you know, and I don't do it for that reason, right? But... I just want to be be able to reach out to them and say, do not fall for the psyop of the pop-up pundit. It's not that I'm in competition with really graceful. I don't even know what her real name is. She's got a little picture here in the back. I don't know if that's some sort of anime uh, graphic uh, uh, software that was processed. You know, I'm not going to really criticize that. Uh, it looks like it, but I'm not going to go there because I got in trouble last time for questioning the gender identity of another pop-up pundit. So I learned my lesson. I'm, I mean, yeah, I'm chastened. Um, yeah. So anyway, um, yeah, Freemasonry, it's reduced to like two or three pages. <laughs> and, and the deal is, ladies and gentlemen, you know this. You probably spend time. Uh, on, on investigating these areas, time well spent because they're, they're about our survival here. Um, and you don't need to depend on these people. Here's a guy, he has academic training. His name's Nick Groom. I first found out about him in a small little book on the Gothic, right? Which was, was uh, germane to my work on the American Gothic. And he has a new book out. I'm going to try to get him on the show. It's going to be a time zone problem, but I, I'm, I'm willing to stay up late to to be with you here. And it came out in 2020. It's a vampire, new history. It's an academic book, right? They're not, that's why I'm saying there's some good signs that in the academic world, not that it's better or superior to solid journalistic work. I'm just saying that for the most part, you're dealing with this level of, um, of quote unquote research. She calls it this stuff research, right? Uh, published by Yale University Press. It follows all the academic and scholarly conventions of citation, attribution, and uh, multiple sourcing that uh, which we should expect, not from these people. But again, the people who just kind of pass through my channel here don't have any discernment, right? Even the ones who've been to college, uh, they, they just... Uh, aren't able to distinguish. Okay, so let me. So anyway, that's um, that's what inspired today. So I said we. What I have to do is to to educate the generation of people who missed Jim Keith. Right. It's not totally their fault that they're falling for people like this, and there's tons of others. Right. On Tube U mostly. Right. It's not totally their fault. Uh, uh, in the case of Jim Keith, he was um, uncere unceremoniously dispatched at age 49. And it happened at the occult ritual known as Burning Man. Most of you are young or old enough to know a little bit about Burning Man and the big, you know, the, the brouhaha. People like um, uh, Mr. Google Eric Schmidt would show up with his top hat and his three or four polyamorous partners, and it was a big deal for Silicon Valley, low-dose hallucinogenic. I call them the hallucinati of uh, Silicon Valley. It was cool for a while, and then it became too big, and I read all the anthropological academic press books on Burning Man, and I realized, oh, this is another operation. I did a 
talk on this early on. I took it down because uh, YouTube wouldn't let me do live stream unless I took down all this copyrighted uh, material. That's another reason why I probably should uh, go to another platform um, because this is for education, right? So if I need to use a scene from Bad Day at Black Rock starring Spencer Tracy about the dis dis mysterious disappearance of a Japanese American internee in a concentration camp. Check out that movie. You can find it on Netflix. But it so happened that that's where Burning Man was held, BlackRock, where there was nuclear testing, by the way. Right? These people are perverse in a dusty area so they can inhale all the radioactive nuclear time. You know, I don't know what was going on. I'm just speculating. So don't, don't go by me. So Jim Keith met his death after his story goes, and you, you can read this material online, so I'm not going to go through it very quickly, though. He fell off a stage three, you know, like three feet or something, and he sprained his ankle. Um, one account I read said he had a fracture and he broke his leg or his ankle or something. But another one said he just sprained. But he went to the hospital because he's in pain. And... Um, this is where the blood clot story comes in because some early know-it-all who came onto my life, yeah, I thought he died because of a blood clot. Well, dickhead, why don't you listen to, to my whole presentation before making your ill-considered uh, dumbass comment. Th th this is why I take so much time trying to help you understand who really graceful is and how these other people who are masquerading as, as um, you know, independent um uh, uh, researchers who are trying to insert, um, you know, some sort of um, uh, pagan religious thought, which which we're very susceptible right now. We're looking for answers, right? We're looking for answers anywhere. By the way, I didn't finish my story about Phoebe here. I thought she was just some crazy woman from the late 19th, early 20th spiritualist movement, like rapping on, ta on uh, tables, uh, ghosts, uh, ghost photographs, right? Seances, Ouija boards. I thought she'd come out of that bag, but you know what? Maybe she was, but she became a convert to Baha'i religion. And she was the architect of the University of California. I thought it was Protestant. It's either Protestant or Catholic, typically, in, in American academia. Right? The medieval um, medieval university was, was based on, on uh, strict uh, conformity and alignment with the church. Early on, it was Catholicism, and then there are you know, Protestant orders as well. But no, Phoebe Hurst just broke the mold altogether. She's Baha'i, and that's one of my recent discoveries here. No wonder the University of California is not bound by Judaism and the moral, you know, the moral uh, background, the laws, the Mosaic law. I mean, you know, you know the story of Moses better than I do. You went to Sunday school or Saturday school, or you you or you read the stories, or or Christianity. She's Baha'i, and I'm not knocking Baha'i religion. I'm just saying that again. One of my assumptions was recently shattered, so now I have to study who is this Baha'i guy. He came to the United States, and she hosted him along with a lot of other crazy, very wealthy women's. That's why I alluded to earlier. It's women's who are behind this because their older husbands who are like 20 to 30 years older than them, this might be their second, third wife. I think um, George Hurst was 20 years older than she. So in other words, she's gonna die a lot quicker or sooner than he is. She, she is, she lived you know, decades beyond him. And so she, who gets the money? And George Hurst was a big gold extractor, silver and copper. He had a big interest in Anaconda, the extract. He's like a Guggenheim without the big family uh, legacy behind it. But he, he was on that level and she inherited all that money so she could put it in all these different institutions. One of them was the University of California and the Anthropological Museum, which bears her name today. And as I told you in an earlier talk, the name of uh, uh, A.L. Krober, Alfred Krober, who she hired I had to buy, thank you very much, Patreons. You allowed me to buy one of the books on Phoebe Hurst. I got it and I found the fact in there. It says that, and I have to confirm it. It says that Phoebe Hurst was the one who hired Krober. She hired him. She, they probably had to run all the professors behind her. 
She never went to college. She was a regent at the University of California, all right? She was the first female regent. She was a regent until she uh, died. Anyway, I'm not going to get into her, her biography. Wait till, you, wait till I get into Jane Stanford, the wife of Leland Stanford Sr., right, as the founder, the railroad baron, amongst other occupations, right, who founded Stanford, which is what I'm going to talk about in a moment, if I can reel myself in on all my different jazz inflected improvisations. Hey, Wayne Shorter died recently, man. Wayne Shorter. He was Buddhist, by the way. So is Chick Corea. So I'm not against heterodox religions and non-Christian religions. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I'm just saying that the University of California is not a Christian organization. Uh, it never was, or maybe it was initially, but um, it's, um, and the Baha'i uh, originates in Persia. It's Persian, you know, modern day, you know, Iran. And so I ask, in fact, everything that this guy's promoting, Phoebe Hearst would love it. She'd probably give him a, a an endowed chair at the University of California in, in uh, religious studies, you know, I would guess. That's how these institutions operate, right? Uh, that's why I'm here with you on YouTube, which is where I want to be. I want to talk directly to the people. That's why I got into the profession, not so I can kiss Phoebe Hearst's ass or all her different administrators, right? <clears throat> you know, I don't wouldn't be able to find her ass. She had, you know, the bustles and the 19th century corsets and all the other stuff and her uh, son is, you, you know, is William Randolph Hearst, and you know about his all his debaucheries down at Xanadu, otherwise known as Hearst Castle. That was her son, you know, newspaper empire. A lot of these people were newspaper people, media, right? All right further down, the Chandler family, you know, on and on, you know. Well, we know about the Washington Post, right? Newspapers. So what? What's what's today's newspaper? It's yeah new sites it's it's online all right that's where the gold is and that's more importantly where you can shape public opinion and ideas and you could swap out their the content of their minds for what you want them to know right we know what social media did to us in the giant psyop of the last three years right so let me continue with uh, jim keith that's the circumstance of his death let me, if you don't want to believe me, let's take a look at a video I haven't queued up for you. Here it is. Pay attention. Jim Keith went where other journalists feared to tread. Among other things, he claimed that Princess Diana and JFK Jr. were murdered. But now, as Doug Bruckner reports, Keith is dead as well. And some say his poison pen may have cost him his life. He was Mr. Conspiracy. The LSD that, that flooded this country was primarily uh, supplied by the CIA. A respected investigative journalist, lecturer, and author of dozens of books that chronicle government cover-ups, political assassinations, and sinister spy networks. One hopes that our government would, um, would have some sense of ethics and morals. As you dig into this, you find that that... Okay. Add it to the stream. Yeah, I don't, it's not a conspiracy, ladies and gentlemen. You got the gist of it. I'm going to, I think it's a memory problem because I have a lot of these videos loaded up here. Uh, videos in particular eat up a lot of memory on uh, StreamYard. So don't be alarmed. But let me just show you some of his, uh, his, his work. That, that are completely ignored now. They've been assimilated. They've been absorbed. They've been plagiarized. They've been reduced to one or two paragraphs in the deep state, so-called encyclopedia or whoever else is out there trying to hustle on YouTube with their little, sh with their little uh, shows that are written professionally for them. And mommy and daddy um, have a little you know, boy or girl there that are hosting these shows. It's so obvious to me. So here's, um, this is Steam Shelf. This is before the internet and before uh, PDFs and all that, right? This was like a newsletter. I don't think, I haven't seen an original copy, but I have a small collection of PDF scans and I'll show you one 
Uh, she, he was one of, Keith was one of the first people to question the official story about the death of the British Lady Diana, right, Diana Spencer. And here's um, Steam Shovel, uh, a newsletter. She has it. There's the masthead. He, he was not a what, the publisher. The publisher was Ken Nunn, who shows up in this uh, earlier video. I'm not going to be able to show it to you. I'll post it on my... Um, I think I think I already did. It's on my Patreon. I posted this video on my Patreon because they don't have a problem with storage. Anyway, this is uh, Steam Shovel Press. Uh, I believe that Steam Shovel is still around. I'm not sure, but look for books by Ken. That's K E N N double N Thomas. Look for those on Tube U. Buy them. Buy any books on on eBay or on. Um, on the Amazon or Abe books or wherever, you know, you're not going to find them in the used bookstores. They've all been scooped up. The reason I'm telling you is that they're, they're slowly disappearing and they're becoming collector's items. So just on the basis of pure investment, you might want to buy some of these books. I happen to have almost all of them and they're just, they've uh, risen in price astro astronomically. And to help people who are supporting me, I have some scans of some of this work that I'm sharing with you on my Patreon site. So you can read, not, not be, for my own self-aggrandizement, so you can read the original work that these pop-up pundits are plagiarizing without apology so that they can erase the history. And they can implant now whatever they want because of people who are just coming into consciousness, as we used to call it, right? The newbies. And the first person they see, oh, that's magic. We're going to follow you, right? You, you, you've you imprinted us. You've you've taken... And, and like I said, there's more people than ever who are looking for answers, right? And the people who are behind this, this uh, orchestrated replacement, right? Getting rid of people like... Uh, Jim Keefe. I don't know the specifics of it. I just don't think that uh, I don't uh, agree with the official story. I don't, I think it's highly unplausible, in fact. But here's this is what he was doing back in the late 80s and 90s, right? But the history's lost. And that's why I do the tribute today. Here's one of his early books Jim Keefe, Mass Control. I have a copy, but here's the PDF Engineering Human Consciousness. Everybody knows this by now, right? That's part of the function. Whenever you say mind control or engineering human kind of the brain, neuro, neuro, oh, yeah, yeah, we heard about that because uh, Whitney Webb talked about it on the Glenn Beck show. So we know, we got it, you know, it's done. But what you don't know is that there are academic journals now that have tons of material. And I know because I have access to all the academic journals and I download all the articles that are like sometimes they're just only coming into press now. And it's far more extensive than any of these people even have a clue about. All right. That's the added value that the Professor Hamamoto channel brings to even people who I agree with. And I'm politically and ideologically aligned because I told you I come from the belly of the beast itself. I know how to navigate. I know how to find information. And I know how to expand on leads. Some of these lot of the leads that I've followed up on were provided by guess who Jim Keith but he gets it wrong sometimes because he's not trained as a journalist or a researcher in fact he got the name wrong of a very important figure that most people don't hear haven't heard about unless you read this material if you read only see only really graceful or what was it fantastic Polly that was her name wasn't it Fantastic or Magnificent Polly. You know, she was the faux American who was actually a Canadian asset. Like Corbett, the Corbett, he's, he's Canadian. He's in Japan. He doesn't speak any Japanese. He doesn't read Japanese. What's What the hell is he doing there? But it's always about America. It's always about America. And I'm Japanese third generation American. No one will listen to me. <laughs> it must be those old World War II movies. We make you Scarface, Joel. Yeah. Uh, like I say, though, for the people who are late 30s and 40s, I, I, you know, I'm cool. I'm finally cool. 
because I come from the land of the video game, even though I don't even play it or use it. Uh, I've been to a lot of those game um, uh, play. They're called Playlands, game lands. You know, they have like six stories, all a video game, all of them that you don't even see in America. I've been there. I, I hung out there. And, uh, look, you know, I knew something was, was happening here. So I'm not talking about, you know, Pong. All right, I'm talking about state-of-the-art uh, games that, that they're rolling out and, and testing out where all the, the uh, young people hang out, you know, the teenagers and children, too. Although there's signs saying no children allowed without parent or no one under 12 allowed after nine, there's a curfew. Of course, they're, they're all over the <laughs> Um, so it's a quite a phenomenon. Okay, here's another one you got to check out. Find this book. It's I don't know how much it's going for now. It's called Mind Control, and we've all heard about. Here's uh, Robert Kennedy. Uh, you know, we were just talking about him. He, he's gonna his uh, son is apparently going to be running for president. So that there's going to be a lot of revisiting this material here, right? This is not ancient history. So this is another Jim Keith. I think it's single authored. Right, that you got to check out. Yeah, Jim Keith here because he he collaborated on uh, different books, which I'll show you in a moment. And of course, if you read it today and you're a newbie, you go, oh yeah, mind control. I know about that. I know OSS, and you know I know all about uh, Cameron Ewan, and you know because that stuff's been repeated ad nauseum, right? And again, that is the conservative retarding. Uh, purpose of this now i don't have i didn't load it up here i'm um, sorry but uh i have a copy of it if i can uh get rid of some of this and i do have some a little bit of time i'm gonna run over i just decided if you're willing to stick with me i'll stick with you <laughs> uh, i'm gonna free up some memory here now that we've seen these videos here and uh, tell you the importance of it okay or Hint at, I'm not telling you anything. You you draw your own conclusions, okay? So in this earlier book that I showed about the mind, you know, engineering human consciousness, he mentioned this guy, Willis W. Harmon, but he misspells it. He spells it H-A-R, well, M-O-N, but it's actually M-A-N, Harmon. So I checked him out. I kind of knew him before, but I did a deep dive on Willis Harmon, and I looked at all the academic journal. I don't look at you. I do look at YouTube. I want to see what people are up to, but I go to the sources. So I got all his old academic, the better, the older, the better. And I got to see what he was up, up to and how he evolved. By the way, I found out that Abraham Maslow, who everybody my age was reading, you know, about peak moments and the hierarchy of needs and all that other sort of pre new age so-called humanistic psychology. I found out the journal where, where he was, was brought to prominence and became a cultural phenomenon, a public intellectual, Abraham Maslow. Younger people might not know about him, but everybody who is my generation read the book. And we know that the, the terminology was psychologized. Now all the terminology is becoming neuropsychiatricized, right? Because he was sort of a a neo-Freudian post that's Maslow, but he started, and I found some of his early articles there as early as 1961. So I did the same uh, maneuver on Willis Harmon and found out where he started, right? Because eventually he wound up, as many of you know by now, or at least you think you know by now, he wound up at the, yes, SRI, Stanford Research Institute. And everyone, oh yeah, Hal Putoff, and uh, yeah, remote viewing, and, and the men that stare at go. It's been so trivialized, right? I don't want us to fall for that psyops of trivialization and know that got that, right? This stuff does not perish, uh, is not perishable. It does not have an expiration date on it. And it's more important today in 2023 than it was when these people were first finding it out the first generation of researchers, people like May Brussel, who I had mentioned before, Alex Constantine is another one that you might not have heard of. You can find, it's, he's hard to find, his material is hard to find. May Brussel's material is there. I think it, uh, Constantine, in fact, is the caretaker or executor of her material. I'm not really sure on that. I have to ask him. I don't even know where to contact him. 
Uh, but you, you can go to Ken Thomas. You can go to uh, Adventures Unlimited is another good publisher. Um, let's see. Yeah, the founder and editor, he's also a writer. He's a very good writer. His name's David Hatcher Childress. He's out in Illinois. He published Mass Control. That's the book I showed you earlier. Mass, uh, subtitled Engineering Human Consciousness, published way back in 1999. The book is you know, over 20 years old by now. And people have forgotten where all this material originated. So buy the books because they're, they're going to be increasingly harder to find as they're, because Amazon will, will eventually chop them off the list or they'll have some, well, they'll put everything on Kindle where they'll burn everything like Kindling and they'll start putting these people out. This is only the advanced guard of what's going to happen on a very large scale. They're going to be all these people who are in their 20s and 30s who think that they know the deep history of the American national security, the techno totalitarian state. And they're going to be doing books. They're doing movies already and uh, video games uh, because um, the conspiracy theory epithet does not work anymore. Right. And um, there's so many, there's a, such a huge audience for behold the pale horse or a pale horse. There's, and the, and the audience for this type of work cannot be contained. So entire publishing houses are being built in order to siphon off that OG, that original gangster energy and knowledge and swap them out with newbies, right? So we're not gonna let that happen. History has, has that kind of practical uh, value for us. And it's not just a tribute, it's not just an homage, but it's a revisiting a material that's important as we speak here, as it was back in 1999, you can't, you know, you read this stuff and you see the copyright. Man, how does it? And if he was alive, I'd ask, how do you do this research? You know, where's your archive? Who are you talking to? Where'd you get this material? Because you do need sources. You do need, um, it, as well as a critical mind, right? So here's a name that um, I came up with, and I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip over it. Uh, he clued me in, Jim Keefe, to this guy, Willis Harmon. And um, as it turns out, he was an SRI guy. But then uh, I think he might, he died, I think, uh, what, 97? I can't remember. Maybe it was 2000. He's, he's passed on. He's with Jesus, okay? Probably doesn't believe in He probably doesn't believe in God. Um, he, he does believe in what later became New Age, right, which is an abrogation of which was why it was developed in places like SRI and by people like him, because he later became the president of an operation in Sausalito. And if you saw my earlier talk on Robin Williams and Montgomery McFate, she's a, I think a Harvard trained PhD in anthropology who consults with the military on how to understand Persian culture or Ukraine or what go over any in the world and get into their mores and their values so that you can take over their country, right? That's what anthropology, that's how it developed to begin with. That's why they're taking Krober's name off the anthropology building at UC Berkeley, because there are enough students now who are listening to my lectures and watching me and hearing from other people that the UC is a fundamentally a radically flawed satanic institution. And most of these Gothic institutions are. It was built into it because it was, it, they're there to perpetuate an empire that we don't even realize is in existence. All right. And I only came to an understanding of by reading people even beyond Jim Keith, right? He was a journalist. He was not an academic. I'm not knocking him for that. But he had those instincts. And there's a lot of material out there that, that have been taken off the shelves. And they've been digitized by, guess who, Google. So they're not available. I have access to this. I told you, I'm a researcher by training. That's my profession, you understand? So I, I can get to this material. And I'm sharing the insights with you, if not the material itself. I'm sharing with my the people on Patreon to support me.
because the rest of the people are usually tourists who, who are in this for entertainment. My patron people are serious individuals, thinking people who want to know about this for their, their own survival, personal, family, community, and humanity in large. They're not, they're not in this for the for the wow factor. Like, oh, well, I didn't know that. I guess now I do know it. I'll just repeat it. And then anything that comes contrary, those people know what they're talking about. All right, that's me. <laughs> okay. So Willis Harmon, as it turns out, goes to becomes the president of the Institute of Noetic Science, I think it's called. Noetic versus it's kind of like poetic. It's not science. It's like knowledge without having to do all the tedious laboratory work. So you have some, you know, there's there's principles uh, as part of noetic, um, not science. I don't think it's a science, but noetics that I understand. That's why we respond to poetry and we can't really articulate our music. We can't really articulate it. We know that it's more than a matter of the 251 cadence in, in popular music and jazz. And we know that it's more than um, canto, Cantus formus in uh, Gregorian chant, that you can't understand it just musicologically. There's something in the spirit that that is that is bringing us, drawing us in. And that's what the artist manages to tap into and puts it out there, right? So I understand where he's come from, but, but there is a political agenda in his so-called noetics. And let me show you what it is. If the video runs... Here it is. This is the agenda. He wants to, and his group and his financial backers, they're probably high-end wealthy females who inherited the money of their dead husbands, uh, who are pouring money into new age, UFOlogy, uh, energy research. A lot of, there's a crazy a lot of wacky uh, ladies, mostly with, with tons of money who are putting putting into it because they believe. And there's probably some value in all of it, right? It's worthwhile. But I'm just saying that it's not an unadulterated, pure pursuit. It's been hijacked by certain um, certain entities, certain interests. And, and they're not ones that are friendly to you and me or even to the people who who hang out with them. So here's the, the real reason why he's into noetic science and thinks that we have to transform the mind and consciousness before we can move to the next stage of evolution. And you know what the next stage is? We hear it all the time, ad nauseum, transhumanism, postism. My Tom Horn and uh, this other guy who's, you know, technology, I forgot his key. We hear the same, same old, same old information, but they don't really specify how we're going to get there. And they usually look at machinery and hardware uh, and material objects say, well, this is how they're going to do it. They're building 5G everywhere, or the Vatican has their own observatory, right? They're into machines. But but Willis Harmon says, no, it's about consciousness. And he's right about that, right? He is right about it. It's not about the machines. It's not about the algorithms. It's about the consciousness. So coming out of SRI, you know, he understood this because they were doing all the government funded research on that DOD, CIA, you, you know, all that stuff, right? That, that's where he comes out of. So he founded this Institute of Noetic Science. And I'm sure if you went to their meetings out in, this is a rich, rich area across the Bay of San Francisco, across the Golden Gate Bridge, and you'll be in Sauce, spook land, by the way, this is Robin Williams land, you know, total, right? ultra connected to the national security uh, apparatus states. That's where they are, you know, uh, Petaluma, place, you know, the wine country, <laughs> you know, uh, the Rothschild has a winery out there, right? You, you know these stories, missing children all the time. The Disney people are up there, the family. You've read Fritz Springmeier, the bloodlines of Illuminati. Very, this is the region I'm talking about. So they have to have a Willis Harmon to say, we have to transform consciousness, human consciousness, not just Americans, not just Canadians, not just the British people, not just the Japanese people. We're going to change global consciousness, world consciousness. All right. And if they succeed in that agenda, 
we're doomed. Bring on all the AI you want. Bring on all the 5G you want. Bring on all the, you know what? That's only going to kill a certain segment of the population. But if you get the consciousness of the bulk, not even the bulk, but a, but a, a significant percentage of the American or the global population, then we're a goner. We're gone. We're done. We're finished. All right. So this is serious stuff here. And who was the first one to, to come up with a name, even though he misspelled it? Will this harm? It was Jim Keefe. That's that's where I learned it. And then I found out where he came. I came up with all the academic articles. I have his profile, right? And I and I have a, a deep understanding of what he represents far more than the people that say, oh, yeah, SRI, Hal Putoff. Uh, who's that? Uh, Ingo Swan. You know, they, 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 they name check all these people. I like think they, they know them personally. So here's here's the the tribute to uh, the work of Willis S. Harmon, or is it W? Yeah, sorry, Willis Harmon. There's no way in the world that we can have national security unless everybody else in the world has national security as well, because we're not going to forget how to make nuclear weapons, even if we do decide to dismantle the ones we have. And so uh, then you have to think about national and global security. And then you realize that nobody feels secure when they don't know where their meal's coming from tomorrow. So you can't separate security from the problems of poverty and hunger. And you certainly can't separate security from the problem of environmental deterioration and uh, impacting the life support systems of the planet. And that necessitates a total change in attitude with regard to our relationship to the planet. So all of these things are um, interconnected in such a way that there's no solution to one problem, national security or any other. There's no solution to one problem without a solution to them all together. And at first glance, that might seem to make the problem much harder and the situation much more complex. On the contrary, it really doesn't, because what it says is what we need is one fundamental global mind change, and all of the problems become much more solvable than they were before. And I think that's what we are somehow intuitively being led to. Shift global and they're going to do it through so-called humanistic psychology neuroscience that's probably a combination to alter human behavior and perception in order uh you know google glasses uh, o oculus rift whatever lsd that was tried in the 60s uh so we're, we're into this current phase now and i'm all about currency and what's happening in 2023 i've read the literature about the sexy nazis i know about enough that i need all I need to know about Operation Paperclip. I mean, people don't ever realize there was Operation Rice Paperclip where all the dead Nazis were replaced by Asian people. In 19, Beginning in 1965, they took all the highly educated PhD level from Taiwan and brought them to, uh, uh, to all the national security facilities around the country because all the Nazis were dying in the older generation. So that's rice paper clip. I wrote the book on it. It's called Servitors of Empire, right? A very important book that no one will, will acknowledge, right? But because, because Pete and even our group who are interested in independent uh, investigation will not acknowledge it. It's beyond their, their, their conception because we're just obsessed by sexy Nazis and Maria Orsic with their jack boots and their insignia and their Ugo Boss uniforms. All right. I like to read that stuff. And I have, yeah, I find it highly entertaining, instructive. And there's some historical lessons and political lessons that we need to know. But like I told you, I'm not just talking. I wrote the book on Operation Rice Paper Clip. Right. Without resorting to the racism of Alex Jones by saying, oh, they're just a bunch of chat comms. Yeah, really? Oh, yeah, that that really makes a lot of sense. Just use the old World War Two and the old uh, colonial terminology. Just sling it around and everything is going to be nice. Just like if we all become of one mind, according to Willis Harmon and other people, by the way.
And I've made some other connections in publishing names, figures that I'm putting out there for, and I'm challenging researchers, not, not, not the pop-ups, but the people who are serious minded. In fact, when I go on Patreon, I put these academic articles on there and I encourage my supporters to give them to their children who are in college and high or in high school or their grandchildren and write research papers on it because their professors will be educated by them because they don't know this stuff. I have them too and I share it. That's one of my strategies of guerrilla warfare for taking back the knowledge base that that the generation of today, of Americans at least, were deprived of. K through 12, which are controlled by the, the, uh, the, the teachers unions, right? The transhumanist corporate funded teachers unions in, in the leadership. And they're, they're, it's handed down through the administration all the way from the, the regents and the, the board members, the corporation. By the way, the first corporation in America was not some company. The first corporation in the United States of America was the Harvard Corporation. You got that? And the corporation, it's a fictive body that outlives you or me. It's transgenerational. Did you know that? No, you don't. So I have an important perspective here that I intend to share with you, not because of my ego stroke, you know, not for my own gratification, not so that I can sell books. I don't have a book to sell. Current, I'm writing one right now, but it's not going to do as well as her because I'm not as cute. I'm not as acceptable. And I'm not, certainly not going to get a contract from one of the white shoe girls who work in the publishing companies whose families put them there. And they're all globalist companies by now anyway. There, there are no true publishers that, that, that we remember from the old days, right? Okay, so that's, uh, I'm going to finish up with Willis Harmon. I'll, uh, I can go on and on about him and his cohort. A lot of this intersects with my ongoing research on the writer Philip K. Dick. Right. More and more, I'm convinced that science fiction is a conservative retarding factor in American culture and politics. Because all the guys who are into and they're mostly guys who are into SF, they're like video game heads. They go, oh, yeah, I mastered level three. I beat the game. I beat the game. I'm going, you know, I beat Super Mario. Right. So I think, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a. They call themselves dickheads, right? Fans of Philip K. Dick. It's obsessive, right? It's like, oh, I'm a fanboy. And, and they're in academia. They write tons of articles on it. But I'm taking the opposite approach. Philip Dick was a conservative, probably on, uh, on a consultant or maybe even an outright asset of one of these intelligence agents. I'm seeing it right here publicly. And I challenge one of these Philip K. Dick experts and authorities who wrote are writing or have written books or doctoral dissertation on that to to um to challenge me on that right and they put it off to his genius her his perceptor his visionary skills with L lsd he only took lsd twice by his own admission right there's something deeper at play here and this is what what i do okay so what I do with, with uh, Joan Rivers situation, I found out she's married to a Warburg who's a Rothschild. And I, I did this with Robin Williams, you know, on and on. These are popular culture figures, right? And, and with uh, Perry Hilton, you know, on and on. And, and I don't pick the usual, the, 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 the loaf hanging fruit, so to speak. All right. I promised I was going to get this done in 60 minutes. I thank you for your tolerance. But I know you got your money's worth, right? Or your time's worth. Time is money, according to uh, the capitalists who invented the the, the uh, punch clock. <laughs> oh, my God. Remember punching the clock? I used to punch the clock. Believe me. Yeah, I'm a man of the people. I've worked in factories. Yeah, I've done the delivery job. I mean, this is even after PhD stuff. I couldn't get a job. Couldn't get a job. Because no one wanted to hear about the new world order, you know. Anyway, thank you for your indulgence. I appreciate it. I apologize to anybody whose illusions have been shattered and your feelings hurt. But you know what? There's, you will sustain greater in, injury unless you 
at least ponder and consider this um, spray of information that I put out there. There's a lot to, to absorb. And again, I thank you um, for giving me this opportunity to be, to be with you this evening. I know it's past 10 o'clock for people on the East Coast. You can watch this on video. Please share it. Please subscribe. I want to, I'm only at 11,000 subscribers because, as you know, I'm not being promoted. And you can join my Patreon to help me sustain the budget <laughs> for buying these books. And uh, I'll return the favor. I'm going to give you goodies that uh, you can't find anywhere else. Just ask any Patreon of mine currently what they get for their support. They get a lot. Anyway, you find out for yourself. And if you don't like it after a month, you can quit. You know, this is not, it's not like a lifelong deal where once you're read in or you're initiated or you get the secret handshake that the only way you can leave is feet first. No, it's not like that. You can just say, oh, I don't like it. But you will like it. You'll benefit from it. So enough with the uh, hard sell. I wish you good night. Uh, I'm going to have a nice... Uh, Thai curry dinner myself. I'm really hungry. Thank you. Bye.